Hello, everybody. How you doing? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. And we're going to read this together. This is a parable of Jesus. It's, there are four or five parables that I really love. And this is one of them. And I love it because it's kind of mysterious. It's kind of strange. It's unusual. It shows a way of thinking that is not the way of thinking which is normally held by people. And, and, and what this is about is this, that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world work very differently. And for us to understand the, the way the kingdom of God works requires some, some pretty heavy lifting, some pretty heavy study. And so Jesus tells this, this unusual parable to help us see the unusual way the kingdom of heaven works. Let's begin reading with verse number one. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, I may do some commentary along the way, who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. Now, I don't know anything about vineyards at all. I'm a city boy, okay? My dad had this gigantic truck farm, and uh, I saw him working at it. He had one muscadine vine in his truck farm. But, you know, one vine doesn't make a vineyard. <laughs> so I don't really know much about vineyards. But Jesus knew that his, his, the people who were listening to him knew. And it made the kingdom of God understandable to be able to compare it with a vineyard. Plus, oftentimes in Scripture, the work of God's kingdom, or even Israel itself, is, is, is compared to a vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius, the, the day's wage. A, 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 the average day's wage for a man was a denarius for the day and sent them to his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who were hired first, that is six o'clock in the morning, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. This is not fair. Where's the foreman? Where's the shop steward? Where's my union? When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Don't you agree? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who was hired last the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm so generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Now Jesus is dealing with two problems that he's been facing throughout his ministry. Uh, one of the problems just occurred. The, um, the rich young man comes to Jesus, probably also a leader or a ruler inside of Israel. And he says, I want to know what, how to, to inherit eternal life, what I have to do. And Jesus saw right away that, that for this rich young man, his money was his God. And so he said, give up all you have, sell, sell it, and give the money to the poor, and then you'll be able to enter God's kingdom. Now, Peter was listening. Other disciples were as well. And Peter misunderstood. Can you believe that Peter misunderstood? Can you believe that? He always seems to misunderstand. And, and he's thinking that it is about money. It is about ha what you have and your position you have. So he says, Jesus, listen, I and we disciples, we have, been, we have given up everything for you. What are we going to receive in return? Let me give you a different uh, translation of that. What's in it for me? What's in it for us? What are we going to receive for all the things we've been doing for you? Now, just going along with this, throughout the gospel, the disciples have been arguing three times now. They've argued about who was greatest in the kingdom of God. Who's going to have the biggest title, the greatest position? John and James, their mother had come to Jesus a few chapters earlier and said, can you give to my sons 
John and James, the right hand and left hand, the messianic kingdom which is coming. So their status and position was really important. Our Lord is facing this, this problem with his disciples about how do you succeed in God's kingdom's work. Now, the other problem is this. The Pharisees and other Jewish leaders were looking down on the people who were sinners. That was most of Israel. They were sinners. And they were resenting the fact that Jesus was reaching out to them and bringing these sinners in. And they said something like this. Well, we've been serving God all of our lives. We've been doing all kinds of good things, obeying the law in all sorts of ways. And yet these sinners are also coming into God's kingdom. They're getting saved and we're all going to heaven. Now, in the end, these two problems are really the same problem. Thinking that our status, our position, what we receive for our service, that's what we're in this thing for, that, that we're saying to ourselves, what's in it for me? That's a very dangerous way to think. So here's the answer that Jesus gives in this wonderful parable. We serve Jesus. We work for Jesus simply because he asks us. He calls us. He says, you come, you work for me. Now, the, the, the owner had a vineyard, and uh, he had to have it brought in, the, the, the grapes brought in. And so he sent his foreman out to the marketplace. That's where the workers would go every morning. Uh, let me just uh, give you more information here. Um, if you want to get a job, <laughs> you didn't go to the, to the classified section or to some kind of, of job-seeking service, okay? You went to the marketplace, you stood around, and the landowners would come in every day, and they would hire. And you would li live or work from day to day. So the money you made for this day would help your family survive to the next day. And so when you got a job, you were very appreciative of your job. I have a job, and I'll be able to feed myself and my family. And the typical day's labor, wage, was a denarius. Everybody got that. On the way home, they passed by the Everything's a Denarius store. <laughs> Inflation hit, though, and it was everything is a denarius plus a quarter. You know how that is. So the way they made it from day to day was making that denarius and working a day in a field somewhere. And so the, the day was, was, was from 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night, and, and it was divided into to four three-hour periods, 6 to 9, 9 to 12, etc. And so at 6 o'clock in the morning, they got hired. And then the, the, the owner saw that there was need for more workers, so he hired at 9, he hired at 12. And then when there's just one hour left in the, in the workday, at 5 o'clock, his priorities change. He's got to get this crop in, and so he goes out and he hires some more laborers at the very end of the day. They go home to work in the field. And they work simply because, this is how the kingdom of God works. They work simply because the owner asked them to. You come work for me. They didn't have to understand how the farm worked. They didn't have to understand the vineyard. They didn't have to understand anything about the job that was to be done. All they had to hear was, will you come work for me? And they said, yes, this is how God's kingdom works. Jesus comes and says, come and follow me. I will make you fishers of men. The fields are white for harvest. We need workers to go out into the harvest field and bring the harvest of people in. We work simply because Jesus asks us to work. We don't have to understand the mission of the kingdom, but you should struggle with it. Why is Jesus doing what he's doing? We don't have to understand anything about how the theology of the kingdom of God works. You should struggle with it. All we have to understand is this. Jesus says to you, come follow me, and you say yes. Now, there are two words that are very important words that you can find out of this passage. The first is duty. But duty is not a very popular word now. It's gotten a bad rap. Duty for us means I have to work and do this thing even though I don't want to do it. I got to cut the grass, pay my taxes, visit my mother-in-law. Out of duty. In other words, this is what I have to do even though I don't want to do it. But that's not the New Testament concept of duty. Duty simply means this. I understand that Jesus is calling me. 
And I also understand that Jesus died for me, gave himself up for me. Everything I have and everything I own has come from Jesus. So when he calls me, I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to serve him, not because I'm rewarded, not because I'll get anything for it. I'm going to serve him simply because he's my Lord, he's my master, he's my savior. Say it another way, duty is honoring Jesus. Duty is doing what is right. And so we serve in God's kingdom because Jesus asked us to. We understand our duty. There's another word here, the word gratitude. That's to be thankful. Now, we may not like the word duty, but we understand the word gratitude. We like it better. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. He said, now we have decided to live every day of the rest of our lives for him who died for us. And so because we understand what Jesus has done and that we don't deserve it, we are serving and working in his kingdom out of gratitude for what he's done. Now, in essence, those two things, duty and gratitude, become the same thing. We understand that we do what we do simply because Jesus has asked us to. And we do it because we see our duty to honor him who died for us. We do it because we're grateful to him who died for us. This past week, at the intersection of uh, Interstate 89 and 91, at the border of New Hampshire and Vermont, there was a dog running along the interstate. Now, I look at it, it's, it's a, it looks like a German shepherd to me. But it's one of the shepherd family. It's not actually a German shepherd. But I'm not a dog expert, so I can't tell you. But it, just think of a German shepherd, okay? Run along the interstate. And the state police want to catch this dog before it gets hurt. So they stop and they, they catch, try to catch the dog. But he turns around and begins running the opposite direction. And they chase him from New Hampshire over into, into, into Vermont. Now, his name is Tingsley. But he didn't tell them. They found out later on, okay? So they're chasing Tingsley, trying to, 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 to catch him, and he leads them to a car in a ditch that's turned over on its top. And in the car is Tingsley's owner, and Tingsley saved his owner's life. Isn't that a cool story? And dogs are like this. Dogs know who their owners and masters are. They love them. There's a relationship there of duty and gratitude Duty because they know that the owner loves them and they want to honor their owner. And they also know the, the hand that feeds them and they, or they're grateful for it. Now, uh, I had a guy in my first church. I only had two churches in over 50, almost 50 years. <laughs> two churches. <laughs> Never mind. Two churches. And uh, he uh, didn't like cats. And so I asked him one day, and I'm just telling you a story because I love cats personally. For 15 years, my second best friend, my first best friend is my wife, but my second best friend was my cat. We were inseparable. But anyway, he didn't like cats. So I asked him, why don't you like cats? He says, well, I adopted a cat. I loved the cat. I fed the cat. I took care of the cat. I had him for two years, took care of him every day. And then one day the cat disappears. And I'm worried about the cat. I searched everywhere for the cat. Can't find the cat. So a few months later, I'm driving on, down the road that leads into my neighborhood. I look over to my right, and my cat is sitting in the window of the house, looking nice and content. Somebody else's house. Get this right. So there's the difference between dogs and cats. I mean, dogs understand duty and gratitude, and the cat says, what's in it for me? <laughs> I don't care who my owner is. The one who feeds me next is my new owner. Yeah, that's where it is, right? So this is, this is what we're talking about. Some of us are cats and some of us are dogs. Some people understand the idea of duty to the one who saved us and called us. Out of gratitude, we respond to his call. We, we do what we do simply because he has asked us to. And once you understand who has asked you, it's Jesus, the Savior, the Lord. We do what we do. Here's the next idea. Our title, our position, what authority we think we have, mean absolutely nothing. Now, I'm pulling this idea out of the passage. I want you to remember Peter saying, hey, listen, we've given up everything for you. What do we get in return? 
And how about James and John? Mom, I think they put mom up to it. Can my sons sit at your right hand and left hand? Can they have the position of authority in the kingdom of God? The disciples are arguing in the boat when the storm is being stilled and calmed all around them. Who's the greatest in God's kingdom? How about the Pharisees saying, hey, we've been doing God's law all of our lives. These sinners don't have the rights that we have. They don't have the position we have. Why is Jesus doing this? Our position and authority, our titles mean everything. And Jesus says, no, you work because I call you. I ask you to. You're just a worker. Do you hear that? You're just a worker. Now, you may think that is a low title to have. That's not important. But the privilege of being able to work in the kingdom of God for our Savior, oh, that's indescribable. But we're just workers. Now, people sometimes ask me, what should I call you? You just meet me, you know. And, And you know how this has always been. We get ordained, they call us reverends. I am a reverend, but please don't call me reverend, goodness sakes. I prefer to be called Ernie. Or maybe your Supreme Holiness the Pope. I don't know which one is better. But <laughs> I've referred to be called Ernie. And sometimes I use the title Pastor Ernie. I put it in my letters, whatever. But even that's not good because that sets me apart from you. So just call me Ernie. Now, I had a heart attack, as you know, almost four years ago. And um, the cardiologist's office sets up after you have your heart attack an appointment for you with your, your, your practitioner, your GP, a week after you get out of the hospital just to check up on you. So I went to my doctor's office and I had a new doctor because my doctor had to retire for medical reasons. And I called my doctor, Karen. It, you know, that's the way it was. So I walk into the office and, and, she, and the, the lady behind the counter says, Reverend Myers. I thought, my reputation has preceded me. <laughs> so the doctor says, Reverend Myers, uh, Please sit down. I'm Dr. Johnson. I said, listen, just just call me Ernie. What can I call you? And her eyes turned into big darts. And she looked at me. She said, Dr. Johnson. (laughs) It's a true story. (laughs) Oh, that's how this game is played, huh? Yeah. And I had the first inclination I had was to ask for her diploma from medical school and her, and her license to practice. You know, if somebody cares about their, their title, their authority, their office so much that they have to, to, to rub it, your face in it, I think they have a little bit of insecurity about who they are. You know, Shakespeare said, what's in a name? A rose by any other name smells as sweet. Why do we care so much about titles, positions, and authority? Why do we care about that? If you have to tell somebody how important you are, you're not important. If you have to tell people you're the leader, you're not the leader. What happens is we we have what we have because we serve Jesus, and people recognize that, and they honor that, that we're just a servant, you know, just like them. What we do, we do. Because you just asked us. And we're just workers. Workers together. And that's all I am. That's all you are. And any respect we have in life is gained simply by being a servant like this. Now, our Lord Jesus, at the Last Supper, took off his outer garment, put a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' dirty feet. What a powerful, acted out parable. What a powerful comparison, a metaphor between how we should be in life, not our title position. He says, listen, I am Lord. You have called me Lord, and, and rightly so. But if I, your Lord, wash your feet, you should wash each other's feet. Now, we've talked about duty. we talked about gratitude. Here's another word for you, Humility. We recognize that whoever we are, whatever we've done, we're just workers. Working in the same field for the same master. And that recognition is humility. Now, 
all, the, these first two ideas have just been the icing on the cake. Here comes the cake. You ready? This whole parable is really about this one thing. Don't ever look down on people for any reason. But particularly as believers, don't look down on people who are not yet believers, not yet Christians. Don't look down on people who may, you may not think are as spiritually mature as what you are. Don't ever look down on anyone. Now I want you to get the, 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 what's, what, what, the, what the dynamic is here. The people who got hired at 5 o'clock, well, the, the, the landowner says to his foreman, bring the workers in, we're going to pay them. And here comes the ones who went to work at 5 o'clock, and they get paid. Now, the ones who started working at 6 o'clock in the morning think, oh, they're going to give them, he's going to give them one-twelfth of a denarius. Get it? One-twelfth of a day's labor. But he gives them a denarius. And then the ones that came to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, they go, oh, boy, we're going to get 12 denarius. Ah! And they get a denarius too. They go, this isn't fair. Have you known people who walk around all the time going, it's not fair. Now last week I talked about something related, that, that life is tough and difficult. And when you accept the idea that life is tough and difficult, it's a freeing thing because then you stop thinking that life owes you something. You, got, you recognize it's a struggle. It's also a blessing. Life is a wonderful thing, but there's a lot of struggle in life as well. When you see that, it changes things. And when you recognize it's a related truth here, that, isn't it, that life is not fair? You have really a lot of progress. But you see, the kingdom of God has a different way of working than the kingdom of the world. A different dynamic involved. So it, it was entirely fair for the master. He said, listen, friend, he was respectful. Listen, friend, don't I have the right to do with my money, what I want to do. And I'm thinking about this guy who went to work at 5 o'clock in the, in the afternoon. He's got a family to feed just like you. And so I'm going to give him a denarius so he can feed his family. And didn't I give you what I promised I would give you, a denarius? Then why are you complaining? Now, uh, Earl and Edna go to the state fair every year. 50 years they go to the state fair. And every year when they go, there's a, there's a biplane. Now, that's a like the, one of those World War I planes, planes with a wing on top, wing on the bottom. And it's a crop duster. Most crop dusters are biplanes. And so there's a biplane there, and a sign on the side of the plane says, take a ride, $50. And Edna wants to go for a ride every year. And Earl always says, Edna, $50 is $50. And finally, after 50 years, she says, Earl, listen, I'm 85 years old now. This might be my last state fair. Can I please go for a ride? Now, the, the pilot of the plane hears him arguing about this, and he says to Earl, listen, I'll give you a ride. I'll give you a good one, too. But you've got to promise me you won't say anything while we're, while we're up in the air. So he takes them up. They do barrel rolls. They do loop-de-loops. They do controlled spins. And finally they land, and the pilot yells back, Edna, did a great job, didn't say a thing. She said, yeah, I was going to say something when Earl fell out. <laughs> but $50 is $50. <laughs> I always laugh at my jokes more than you do. I don't know what it is. Well, Daenerys is a Daenerys. Why didn't you pay us what we should have gotten? Jesus says, hey, you've got to understand how the kingdom of God works. I can do with my money what I want to do with my money. And I saw the need of this person who began to work at 5 o'clock and I did what was right. And I did what was right with you too. I paid you what I promised. Now here's what happens. People who are believers look down on people who aren't believers. I can't believe this. I can't believe it. It's always been this way for me and what I've done as a pastor. In my first church, we, had a, we built a parking lot. And we had guest parking put in. And the first Sunday we came from the guest parking, all the members were parked in guest parking. I went up to them and said, why are you parked in guest parking? They said, we didn't raise all this money and pay all this so that the people we don't even know could get the best parking spaces. Can you believe people said this? That's actually what happened. And it even happened here when I came to our church 31 years ago. People would demand it. We had a lot of people start joining church. And we had a great number of people join church in 2021. And 31 baptisms, which is not our rec anywhere close to our record number of baptisms. But it was a great thing to have happen during a virus. 
And we also gave $200,000 more last year than we did the year before the virus. Isn't that amazing? Praise God for what he's done. But anyway, getting back to what I'm talking about. I've known many believers who resent those who are unbelievers. Here's what I've heard. I got saved at six, and I've served in the church for my Lord faithfully. Now I'm 80 years old, and here's this good-for-nothing skunk I've known all my life, and now he's on his deathbed dying from cancer, and he just became a Christian, and he's going to go to heaven too. That's not fair. (laughs) Can you believe people think that way? And here's how the way the kingdom of God works The reason you worked from the time you were six for the kingdom of God and for its glory is so people like that good-for-nothing skunk can get saved on his deathbed and enter into God's kingdom. We don't work because we are paid. We don't work for authority, position, or title. We don't serve because we get anything out of it at all. We work simply because Jesus asked us to. And what he does with you as you work is he does amazing things. And I'm thankful just to be along for the ride. That's how, by the way, I feel about being married. Yesterday was my wife's birthday, my best friend. And I've been married to her now for almost 48 years. I feel very thankful just to be along. (laughs) It's been a wonderful thing. And I feel great that I've been, I became a Christian when I was 16 years old. And God took me with, with my speech impediment and all the problems that I had in my life and my, my messed up family. And he took me and he did something wonderful with me. I'm just a worker. I'm just a worker. And all the things I've done and all the things you do, so people who do not know Jesus can also know him. And when they die, enter into the same heaven that I'm going to. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in this very powerful parable where Jesus talks about the way the kingdom of God works, and he summarizes it. The last will be first and the first will be last. Works a whole different way than the kingdom of the world. And so we work in that kingdom simply because he asked us. Not because of what we paid, not because of status or position or authority simply because he asked us to. He asked us to work in his fields and bring in the people who need to be harvested for the kingdom. He asked us to be fishers of men. He promises the gifts, the talents, the abilities to be able to do it and the resources to be able to do it. And he's pro- every promise he's made, he's kept. We get a chance to see across our years of work people's lives be changed and people being saved all because you used us. Thank you, Father. Now there might be some people here who you're asking to come and serve in your kingdom. You're asking them to believe in Jesus. Maybe they're watching online. Maybe they're watching at West Portsmouth. And I pray, Lord, that right now they'll say yes to Jesus as he asks. If you're one of those people, pray this prayer with me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. I pray that you'll come into my life and work a great miracle of forgiveness, all because Jesus Christ died for me on the cross. And may I have the Holy Spirit as well, that I might have a relationship with you and know that I'm saved. In Jesus' name. Now, if you pray that prayer with me, please let me know on the card you find in the chair or talk to an online counselor. We'll talk with you more about your faith and what it means to be a believer and help you to grow. But for all of us now, we recognize that what we really are is simply a worker. Working together in the kingdom. I pray this now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.